related deaths. This debate will be concluded without any questions being put. Can I ask those members who wish to speak in the debate to press the request to speak buttons now? I would also have to tell you this debate must conclude by two o'clock. So I'm going to give warning to the three final speakers that uh, Neil Finlay, Fulton McGregor and Michelle Ballantyne, I may have to cut your speeches to three minutes and also say to the Minister, we have to conclude on two as the Parliament's business begins then. Right, I call Monica Lennon to open the debate, please. Seven minutes, Ms Lennon. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Back in September, when I raised with the First Minister the worrying increase in the number of people dying as a result of alcohol and drugs harm, I wanted to draw particular attention to the issue of stigma. Stigma stops people from getting the support they need and is costing people their lives. And stigma is also harming the families who are affected by substance misuse. Today, we have an opportunity to agree that we need to do much more to change attitudes and develop a new national conversation on drugs and alcohol. We must work together to achieve this. Stigma stops us from having honest conversations with family, friends and colleagues about alcohol and drugs harem. Language contributes to this. Labels like LK and JK and Junkie, which dehumanise people, TV characters like Methadone Mick poke fun at some of the most vulnerable people in our communities, people with underlying mental health problems, people who are likely to have experienced trauma, neglect or abuse. I grew up watching Rab C. Nesbitt on BBC Scotland. Rab is best known as the string-vested alcoholic layabout, who is the central character in what the BBC website describes as Glasgow's greatest ever sitcom. His illustrious CV, according to the BBC, includes workshy slob and all-round nutter. Rab and James A. Cotter and their working-class bampottery gave us the impression that drinking to excess was a lifestyle choice and certainly not one that the middle class uh, would make. We even had Rab C. Nesbitt Christmas specials. Losing my own dad to alcohol harm in 2015 has perhaps tempered my sense of humour, but today I don't feel much like laughing along with snooty, class-based prejudice dressed up as entertainment. Perhaps it's because I felt the suffocation of stigma, that cloak of shame that stops people from accessing treatment and support, and walking through the door of Alcoholics Anonymous or Narcotics Anonymous or any 12-step programme. Or because I know that stigma hurts the people who are affected by the harmful drinking or drug use of a loved one. I ask people affected by alcohol or drugs harm to get in touch and to share their stories with me. I was especially struck by the testimony of Alan Brady, who grew up in Easter House with an alcoholic father. Alan was a traumatised youngster. He witnessed violence and chaos that no young person should ever see. Later in life, in fact, quite recently, Alan wrote a play based on his experiences and he discovered that many, have, many of his childhood friends had gone through much of the same, but none of them had talked about it. Alan is a proud member of Alanon and he has welcomed this debate today because he says it's often worse for the families of alcoholics and especially for children. We are all well briefed on the statistics and the facts. 1,265 alcohol deaths and 867 to drugs in 2016 alone. It's a combined cost of £3.6 billion a year to the Scottish economy in dealing with the harmful effects of drinking. But it's the very human costs of these cold, hard facts which can be harder to convey. For every person who remains in the grip of alcohol or drugs harm, there are countless individuals, families and friends affected. Alan put it perfectly when he said, there are women and men in Scotland today going to their work, going to the shops, trying to hold families together with their hearts blazing and their heads screaming. This has to change because people need to feel able to talk and to know that they'll not be laughed at. That's why I believe that we urgently need a national conversation about the role of drugs and alcohol in our society. I've already raised this issue with the Scottish Government and uh, in regards to a national information campaign. And I look forward to exploring this when I meet with the Public Health Minister in the new year. 
For it is estimated that 51,000 children in Scotland today are affected by a parent's harmful drinking. Dr Catherine Calderwood, Scotland's Chief Medical Officer, writing in the Sunday Post in October said, those affected by parental substance misuse are among the most vulnerable in society and they need particular care and support. The Chief Medical Officer is correct. Cross-departmental working is vital and I'm pleased that the Children and Young People's Minister is here today and I urge the Scottish Government to make this an urgent priority and to use the upcoming Child and Young Person Wellbeing Strategy and the 2018 Year of the Young Person to mainstream these issues of alcohol and drugs harm on young people. It's five days until Christmas and at this time of year it's human nature to want to be in the company of the people you love and the people who love you back. But if you are a child affected by alcohol or drugs harem without the sanctuary of school, the festive season can be lonely and it can be scary. A focus on young people and the families affected by alcohol and drugs misuse has to be central to the forthcoming strategy refresh. Giving support to those affected by substance misuse is vital to breaking this cycle of misery. During the lifetime of the Scottish Government's 2008 alcohol strategy and 2009 drug strategy, 15,077 people have died from substance misuse. And I've been trying to put that 15,000 number into context, and that's the equivalent to the entire population of Lark Hall, one of the towns that I represent. If we continue at this rate, in 10 years' time, by 2027, the population equivalent of another significant town will have been wiped out too. That amounts to a national crisis. So of course I welcome the policy refresh that's underway, but when 15,000 people have died during the course of the current strategies, we have to be brutally honest that it's not simply a refresh that's required, it's time for a reality check. But I am optimistic we can start to change this and I'm very grateful to MSPs of all parties who have signed the motion to make this debate possible. And I want to thank the many individuals and organisations who provided briefings and all the organisations who are holding people up. I won't name you all because I'm watching the clock and I want to conclude, presiding officer, by extending a heartfelt thank you to members of the public in the gallery who've travelled from various parts of Scotland and to everyone who's shared their stories with me. If you have recently lost a loved one due to drugs or alcohol harm, I realise this will be a very challenging time for you. Those of us who have lived through it understand, and I pray you will find comfort and peace this Christmas. You are at the heart of this debate, and if we listen and act on what we learn from you about alcohol and drugs harm, I believe we can set Scotland on a journey of radical culture change. Change that is urgent, necessary and possible. Thank you. I'm sorry to hurry people, but as I say, time is pressing. Uh, Claire Hockey followed by Miles Briggs. And if you can all shave a little bit off your speeches, we'll get everybody in a reasonable speech. Uh, Claire Hockey, then Miles Briggs. Thank you, President Officer. And I would like to thank Monica Lennon for bringing this important debate to the Chamber. I also remind members of my register of interest as I'm a mental health nurse who holds an honorary contract with Greater Glasgow and Clyde NHS. There can be no denying that Scotland continues to have a very troubled relationship with both drugs and alcohol, and it's an uncomfortable reality and one we must not shift from, in that deaths from drugs misuse across the UK is rising, whilst alcohol-related deaths are higher now than they were in the mid-1990s. However, it is a problem which the Scottish Government are committed to tackling. At the start of next year, they are set to unveil a new alcohol strategy. In spring, a combined alcohol and drugs treatment action plan, and in May, the minimum pricing policy will come into force. During a statement to Parliament last month, I raised the issue of so-called drug consumption rooms with the Public Health Minister. Drug consumption room, rooms, otherwise known as safer consumption facilities, are places where illicit drugs can be used under the supervision of trained staff. <laughs> Although a controversial subject, it is an initiative that I support, as I fully believe it could help to save lives. Officially sanctioned DCRs have been in existence for over 30 years and they currently exist in eight European countries as well as Canada and Australia. Sydney through the 1990s particularly struggled in the fight against heroin and knowing the demands of the drug, many businesses would rent out rooms to users so they had a private place to inject. This practice continued with police turning a blind eye to it. However, it fueled further criminal activity as many businesses would then sell drugs themselves.
To tackle the problem, Australia's first safe consumption room was established in 2001, at a time when I actually lived near the city. In the 10 years after it opened, ambulance call-outs to drug users near the facility reduced by a staggering 80%. The success of the scheme hasn't gone unnoticed, and local government in Victoria, Australia, have recently announced plans to pilot a safe injecting room in a Melbourne suburb. Presiding officer, robust evidence demonstrates that these facilities reduced street injection, they decreased the number of syringes discarded on the streets, and the risk of needle sharing is minimised. Drug-related deaths are reduced, whilst they also increase the uptake in drug treatment. A cross-party group at Westminster recently commissioned a report undertaken by a drug policy think tank who found that the drug consumption rooms do not increase drug use, the frequency of injecting, drug dealing, drug trafficking or even drug-related crime in the surrounding areas. Furthermore, research also shows that not one single person has died of an overdose in a DCR. Ultimately, safe injecting in a, a safe environment gives the user the opportunity of life-saving intervention should they overdose, while they're also able to receive help from addiction services, social care staff and other healthcare professionals. These are opportunities which may not be readily available to those with chaotic lives or those who do not readily engage with such services. Presiding officer, as it stands, the risk to the user and the public remains too high, so a change in thinking is required. For the user, they often take drugs in alleys, hidden under bridges or out of sight. So if they were to overdose, there is no immediate help available. For the public, there remains a risk of coming across discarded needles and syringes and injecting equipment. Safe injecting rooms are an obvious solution to this problem. DCRs have become far more prominent over the last year following a concerted effort to establish one in Glasgow. For a safer consumption facility to be granted legal permission to operate, it would require an exemption from the Misuse of Drugs Act by the UK Government. However, they are not currently minded to grant this exemption. As the proposals put forward by Glasgow Health and Social Care Partnership have hit an impasse. An impasse. If the UK Government are willing to, under, to grant the exemption, they must commit to devolving the powers to our Parliament. Scotland's relationships must be I'm afraid must you must changed, conclude. And radical solutions like DCRs must be considered. Sorry, you must conclude. I call Miles Briggs to be followed by Ruth Maguire. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And I'd like to start by congratulating Monica Lennon on securing today's important debate. And I'd also like to commend her for speaking so frankly in the past and so movingly about her own personal family experience and having a family member with an alcohol addiction. I'd also like to thank those organisations here today in the public gallery for providing useful briefings ahead of today's debate. Like Monica Lennon, I share the concern that the 2016 alcohol and drug related death statistics show such an increase on the previous year. In my own Lothian region, there were 150 alcohol related deaths last year, an increase of 20 on 2015, and this compares to 72 recorded in 1980. Each and every one of these deaths is a tragedy for the individual involved, their family and friends, and for our society more generally. And each is preventable, and I hope that is the message which we'll send out from today's debate. The work of local drug and alcohol partnerships in our communities is vitally important, and that is why the Scottish Conservatives expressed such concern at the government's almost £15.5 million cut to funding for these partnerships in the 2016-17 budget. Cuts which half of the NHS boards in Scotland um, did not simply cover and which led to unacceptable pressures and constraints on local provision in many areas and the destabilisation of services which are already in place. The Scottish Government's belated recognition of the error it made in reducing this funding is welcome, but it's deeply regrettable that it happened in this way. Alcohol fo Focus Scotland in its briefing for today, today's debate ra rightly states that preventable measures have a pivotal role to play in preventing drug and alcohol related deaths. Education information is key so that keep people can, be make, can make informed choices and understand the risk of heavy, of heavy drinking. We need to see a particular focus on Scotland's most deprived communities where people are six times more likely to die due to alcohol compared to those in more affluent parts of our country. The clarity over minimum unit pricing and the fact that this will now be moving forward is a welcome policy intervention. A 10% possible reduction in alcohol-related deaths by the end of the 20-year period is welcome, but this can just be one tool in a broad range of measures we need to help tackle alcohol misuse in Scotland. The importance of preventative measures in education applies also to drugs as does the need to reduce the huge health inequalities in drug-related deaths. 
The vast majority of drug deaths involve opioid, uh, opioids, and it's an alarming that the number of hospital admissions for overdoses of opioids increased substantially in 2016 and was running at almost 50 each week. We need to have an honest and open discussion about the effectiveness of some of the programmes we have in place. That's why I was keen to call on the Minister and the Cabinet Secretary to look at reviewing the programmes which are in place, and I also support what Monica Lennon has said today. Well, we can all support individual measures to prevent and tackle, tackle alcohol and drug misuse. All these measures are valuable, but I think we need to recognise that we need to develop a new and transformative approach and actually look at the huge challenges which our country face, both in alcohol and drug misuse. And we need to use the changes and see the changes in societal and cultural changes which Monica Lennon spoke about in terms of how we depict people and the stigma which we attach to them. In conclusion, Deputy Presiding Officer, I would reiterate my call and that of Monica Lennon um, to both the Cabinet Secretary and the Minister during their statements on both the alcohol and drug strategies to convene in the new year a cross-party working group on both alcohol and drugs misuse so that we can work across portfolio. That is something which this Parliament keeps hearing, that we need to start looking beyond just the portfolios which each minister covers. And I think in the new year that should be the resolution of ministers, that we start to look at how we do tackle this. I believe tackling this issue can unite this whole Parliament to work together to develop and implement a policy change that must be made to ensure, ensure that in future years we demonstrate that our work has led to a decline and a continuous one in the now you must conclude you must issues. conclude sorry Ruth McGuire followed by Colin Smith presiding officer I thank Monica Lennon for bringing this important topic to the chamber and I'm sorry that we appeared to be short of time uh, stigma remains a huge problem when it comes to addiction and recovery. I've mentioned before when talking on this subject that my heart sinks a little bit when I receive media requests for a response to a drug or alcohol related story when I know what they're looking for is a sensational or judgmental comment. I think it's incumbent on all of us in here to challenge that and do all we can to tackle stigma because in reality problematic alcohol and drug use is something that we're all impacted by. It's not something that can be othered. It's not other people problems. Alcohol and drug abuse affects us all and every single life lost is an absolute tragedy, not just to the family and friends of the person we lose but to our whole community. It's in all our interests to work together and do our very best to both prevent the damage and loss caused by addiction and to aid recovery. Not only is this of immeasurable benefit to the individuals leading healthier and happier lives but it's of benefit to us all, happier, healthier, safer communities too. I'd like to use the time I have to let Parliament know about a unique programme to North Ayrshire that was created and developed by two young persons drug workers, Claire and Donna. Charlie is a 30-week group work peer support programme for children between 8 and 12 who are affected by parental substance use. And I've been really privileged to see it in action and meet the young people a number of times over the years. The programme gives the children space to speak about parental substance use in a safe environment with other young people who know exactly what they're experiencing. The peer support aspect has been consistently cited by the young folk in evaluation as one of the most valued aspects of the programme. The programme also incorporates mindfulness and emotional regulation as well as first aid and basic drug awareness. Through evaluation, they consistently find that young people have a significant reduction in self-reported levels of anxiety or worries as they describe it. And they also see increase in feelings of inclusion and respect. The greater understanding of substance use and being able to freely speak about it without fear of repercussions is something that's regularly fed back as being positive for young people on the Charlie programme. A Charlie teen film was made by some of our young girls in North Ayrshire who were affected by parental substance misuse. The workers Claire and Donna brought them together to do a peer support group. Throughout the group, the girls were clear that they wanted to get their own stories out. They wanted young people like them to know they weren't alone. The girls had felt so alone themselves and they didn't want others feeling like that. They decided that a film was the best way to do this and they told their stories. One of our girls speaks about losing a parent to overdose when she was very young. And tragically, during the filming, she lost her grandmother, who she was living with due to alcohol misuse. During the filming, one of the other girls lost her mother, again due to alcohol. This video has been used in training for child protection, some of which was facilitated by the girls themselves, who I should say are young women now, and all doing very well in training and employment. 
I would like to finish by thanking their workers for the vision, care and love that they showed our young people in North Ayrshire and the girls for their honesty, creativity and kindness in making their film, which has undoubtedly helped others. I am really proud of you girls. Thank you. Thank you very much. I call Colin Smith to be followed by John Finney. Mr Smith, please. Thank you, President Officer. Can I also add my thanks uh, of others to my colleague Monica Lenn for tabling this uh, incredibly important motion. Last year there were, there were over 2,000 drug and alcohol related deaths in Scotland, an increase of 10% in those caused by alcohol reaching its highest point since 2010. And the number related to drugs hit an all time high, increasing by 23%, two and a half times that of the UK as a whole and the highest in Europe. But these aren't just statistics, they are real people real lives and real families needlessly destroyed. President Officer, we owe it to each and every one of those victims of drugs and alcohol to have an open and honest debate about why we are failing those who so needlessly lose their lives and the loved ones they leave behind. And why we need to take bold and transformative action to tackle addiction, starting by focusing on the causes of those addictions. All too often, the burden of alcohol and drug addiction falls disproportionately on those from our most deprived communities. Just yesterday, the latest long-term monitoring of health inequalities in Scotland report revealed that those from our most deprived communities are more than nine times likely to die an alcohol-related death than their better-off counterparts. While the alcohol-related death rate amongst the wealthiest has remained fairly static, the rate amongst those from our most deprived areas has increased in each of the past three years. And when it comes to the impact of drugs, the record is no different. Last year, drug-related general hospital emissions were more than 16 times higher amongst those from our most deprived communities compared to those from our wealthiest areas. The recent NHS report, Drug-Related Deaths in Scotland, highlighted the profound impact an austerity-driven agenda can have when it said, and I quote, the social, economic and political context of the 1980s, and in particular, rising income inequality and the erosion of hope contributed to a rise in drug deaths. The report, which looked at drug-related deaths from 1979 to 2013 found that the risk of death from a drug addiction was 10 times higher among men living in the poorest neighbourhoods than women in more affluent areas. It is no coincidence that today many of the deaths from substance misuse are among older people whose addictions first took hold in the 1980s but are only now facing the multiple health problems those addictions have caused. The relationship between health and wealth inequalities therefore could not be more stark and the lessons of the 1980s could not be clearer. If we continue with the current policy of austerity and the loss of hope that brings, then in 30 years' time we will be back here debating again how many more lives were needlessly lost. Recent research by Neve Short of the University of Edinburgh also found that not only were those from our most deprived communities more likely to die due to alcohol, they also have access to considerably more places to buy alcohol than those in our more affluent areas. That research highlighted a range of reasons, including the high reliance on resources in the local vicinity and an increased use of alcohol as a coping mechanism. And it concluded that those from lower socioeconomic groups are bearing a double burden of low income and a higher risk environment. The research was clear. Radical policies are required to address inequalities, both the social, political and economic drivers of poverty, but also alcohol availability. So changes to licensing of alcohol, labelling and advertising need to be part of any future strategies on alcohol, including accepting that one of the consequences of minimum unit pricing will be an increase in income for retailers, who no doubt will try to use some of that extra income to boost advertising. And those strategies will also need to address the impact of online alcohol sales and the way they can bypass local licensing. In concluding, President Officer, any strategy must also be properly resourced. I saw at first hand the heartbreaking impact on my community of the 24 per cent cut in funding for alcohol and drug partnerships in recent years by the government. If we are serious about tackling the impact of drugs and alcohol in Scotland, never again can we turn our backs on those with addictions who rely on the lifeline services provided to them from our alcohol and drugs partnerships. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Uh, now the open speeches are all three minutes. John Finney, followed by Brian Whittle. Uh, thank you very much indeed, uh, President Officer. I'd like to congratulate Monica Lynn, not just for uh, bringing this motion here, but for our, our ongoing um, work in this, this area, and particularly our reference to stigma, which I think, as others have said, is a very important factor. Now, also grateful to the, the people who give us uh, many of the briefings, but as others have said, uh, of course, we're talking about people here, and uh, the, uh, these are mind-boggling figures that are outlined in, in, uh, 
Ms Lennon's uh, motion, and uh, we have to ask why. I, I've, in my second period at, in the Parliament here, I've spoken many times in these debates, no doubt repeating much of what I've said before, and I, I don't want to keep coming back. So what, what has to be accepted is that the present situation is unacceptable. Um, and there's a, lot of, there's, there's a lot of reasons for that. Um, I think strategies are very important, but we are talking about people and the influences. And there's no doubt there's a deep-seated influence of alcohol in our culture. I'm a very keen football fan, listen to football on the radio, think it's odd that I'm one of the few people that don't have a, apparently have a bet on the game or are going for a drink after the game. And that's not to be a killjoy. It is to say that that is about normalising behaviour. And one of the briefing talks about something that I have mentioned in this chamber before, a very fascinating speech we had from a professor from Cardiff University. I forget the gentleman's name, forgive me. But he talked about the social media and the influences. And it's not people of my generation, indeed, with the greatest respect, looking around, it's not anyone in this chamber that the uh, alcohol industry is trying to influence. It's trying to influence teenagers. And it is about normalization. And the example was given of a particular product where it's such and such a day, so this is such and such a product. And it is that drip feed message. And the, the effect that that has on our communities is, is significant. I'd like to contrast these industries. We've got a, a legal industry, um, which has huge public impl uh, implications. The state derives income from it, and I'm talking about the alcohol industry, um, and, but it also incurs great expenditure, expenditure in respect of health, social care and justice. Um, and we have another one that's criminal, and the question has to be asked when it has the, exactly the same implications. Why aren't we taking a, a, a different approach? Now, I welcome the change that we've seen with the Scottish Government that is looking on uh, drugs as being more a health than a justice-related issue. But we must, we must, as others have said, uh, Colin Smith here, for instance, ensure that the support mechanisms are there, because all the evidence suggests that people need support. The issues of lapsing is, is very important. So there are other been important issues uh, that's been talked about. Safe consumption rooms are an absolute integral part of it. It's not the answer but it has to be part of, part of the answer. As regards the refresh, I don't believe we need a refresh. I mean, we need a fundamental change, and I hope that we'll listen to the practitioners and people who have suffered from these addictions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Brian Whittle, followed by Neil Finlay. Mr Whittle. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer, and can I thank Monica Lennon for bringing this important debate to the Chamber to be discussed and highlighted once again. The statistics for Scotland are stark reading. Scotland has the unwanted tag of the drug and alcohol related death capital of Europe and those statistics are on the rise but possibly the most telling statistic though uh, is the fact that Scotland's alcohol death rate is one and a half times that of the rest of the UK and the drug death rate is two and a half times that of the rest of the UK. However for me the most powerful wording in the motion is the assertion that alcohol and drug deaths are preventable but we do need a consistent and targeting funding uh, strategy. Uh, however, and, and, and as we know, as already been said, the, the draft budget was cut uh, for the Alcohol and Drug Partnership in 2016-17 and the allocation remains the same unchanged for this year. Now we're having a, a, a refresh and I, I often wonder how many are, are, are these ADPs supposed to create a long-term and cohesive strategy in treatment and prevention under these ever-moving conditions? And then the costs of an ineffective strategy are high, not just in monetary terms, which of course manifests itself in the health budget, in, in the welfare and justice budget, more importantly in the unseen human costs within the family network who have to live with and support that loved one who has that addiction. And quality of, that quality of life is impacted. And in the long term cost on the most vulnerable in those situations, the children, is sometimes overlooked. Growing up in that kind of environment, going home dreading the situation they may find when they get there has such a huge detrimental effect on their mental health, on their confidence, or even their ability to just be children and have their friends over. That has to inevitably spill over into the need for mental health interventions, for behavioural issues, educational attainment, and contact with the judicial system. And this must speak to the potential barriers to a sort of long-term integration into society. And that leads me on to the need for a joined-up approach when considering our health strategies. Alcohol and drug addiction has a huge footprint in mental and physical health issues. When pulling together this uh, refresh strategy, what consideration was given to the mental health strategy or, or educational support strategies or, or even the judicial strategies, not to mention obesity and diet strategies? Government departments must start speaking to other, one another and recognise that these strategies are linked. And Deputy Presiding Officer, I'm, I'm fed up hearing about prevention 
an early intervention talked about in this chamber, only to see lip service paid to it when it comes to ideas and policy. If it's about budget, it's time the money you, it, it, it's time the money you wouldn't have to spend if a cohesive comprehensive strategy was implemented, be investigated and entered into the balance sheet. Most importantly, though, this has to be about the human cost of those having to live with this disease, both the addicts and the long-term implications of those who support them. And I see I'm running out of time, so that I'll leave my contribution there. Thank you very much. Uh, Neil Finlay, followed by Fulton McGregor. Uh, President officer, I'll focus my comments on drugs, uh, drugs issues just because of time. Um, supply and demand changes over the decades. Today, the streets are awash with cheap cocaine, previously only affordable to the middle classes. And new psychoactive substances uh, is the latest drugs phenomenon. It's an undeniable fact that some drugs can cause death. Scotland has an appalling record on drug deaths. Figures published by the Office of National Records show drug deaths two and a half times the rate of the rest of the UK. The worst in Europe, 867 of our fellow Scots died using illegal or prescription drugs in 2016. A 23% increase from the previous year. 106% more since 2007. These are shocking statistics that should shame us all. Imagine the reaction if we saw a 106% increase in deaths from heart disease or stroke. There would be outrage. There would be an action plan. There would be budgets allocated, working groups. But this is about drug addiction, so there's no outrage, little media coverage, no task force, not a mention in Derek Mackay's budget. Indeed, last year, the budget for drug and alcohol partnerships was cut. Why? Well, cynically, I suppose there's few votes in addiction. In my work, I come in to contact with a number of families affected by drugs and, uh, drugs and addiction. It can affect any of us, any of our families, any of our friends, and it could affect any of us. But the reality, of course, is that drug and alcohol deaths disproportionately impact on the poorest communities. Dr drug and alcohol deaths are overwhelmingly a class issue because poverty, unemployment, low pay, poor housing, isolation and despair, alongside cuts to essential services, create a yawning gap where people resort to drugs or alcohol in an attempt to take away the pain and misery of life or of past trauma. I attended a seminar by the Scottish Futures, Scotland's Futures Forum a few weeks ago, and the purpose was to look back at the forum's report of 10 years ago into drugs policy. The sad reality is much of that good work failed to shift policy in any, any meaningful way. This has to change. We have to face up to the fact that our drugs policy has failed. People are dying in record numbers. The streets are awash with drugs. Cocaine is affordable now to many. The war on drugs has failed and is contributing to a public health crisis. We will never arrest our way to a drugs-free society and we cannot criminalise all dealers and users. Uh, we have to stop people taking drugs in riskier environments. And politicians have to face up to the fact that policy has failed. And we have to put treatment and public health at the heart of the issue. I don't have all the answers, no one does. But I want to see a major review of drugs policy, a real and genuine brave national debate, debate that has to start now. And I know parliamentarians from all parties share this view. We need action, Minister. We need it now. And we need to have that national debate. This is too important to be party political. This has to involve all of us now. You must conclude. Thank you. Uh, I call Fulton McGregor, followed by Michelle Ballantyne. Thank you, President Officer, and I'd uh, also like to echo what others have said and uh, thank Monica Lennon for bringing this debate to the Chamber and just quickly remind the Chamber that I am the PLO to the Health Secretary. Um, also, Monica's uh, very brave story um, that, she, that she's relayed in here. My own experience uh, of working in social work um, for 12 years echoes a lot of, of what Monica said when I worked in the child protection team. Uh, inevitably, a lot of child protection cases, uh, there was alcohol and drugs had some factor in it, if not the, the vast majority. And then more latterly, injustice, as John Finney had talked about as well, a vast majority of folk that were coming through the justice system had some form of substance misuse uh, problem as well. And, and actually, I welcome the changes to the recent community payback orders, allowing um, the uh, treatment orders to be put in place to help people. Uh, I welcome, obviously, the, the, the strategy uh, unveiled by the Minister, the refresh of the strategy, uh, as others have said, and also the minimum unit price, and I think that these go um, some way to, to addressing the issue. It would have been remiss of me if I hadn't spoke. Um, Brian Whittle had talked about Scotland being the, the drug and alcohol capital of Europe, while Monklands, which Coatbridge Forum's a half of, is 
historically known at certain points as the drug and alcohol capital of Scotland. So I think that it's only uh, right that I should stand up and speak to that. And just um, this year in August, um, the, it was, the shocking statistics were revealed that uh, the alcohol-related deaths were the highest in Lanarkshire for some time. At the same time, the NHS Lanarkshire uh, were cutting the alcohol and drug partnership by around about 10%. Uh, it's something that I wrote to Callum Campbell uh, about, and I know that I've had support from the Minister uh, uh, and others in doing that. But this is a, a multi-layered issue, as others have said. We've got to leave politics at the door, party politics, uh, I should say, at the door. You know, we need to benefit, we need to find ways to to, to deal with this problem. Um, and I'd like to take the opportunity in the, the minute that I've got left to talk about a local uh, organisation, presiding officer, Reach Advocacy, based in Coatbridge, who worked to promote practice within the addiction and mental health field on a dual diagnosis basis, because as others have said, that is uh, so important as well. And it encourages the recognition of their client's right to health. They work to put the person before the label and to understand a person's history and their life's poverty, social inequality, trauma, abuse, environment, there are many common themes contributing to unfair differences in people across social groups. And unequal distribution of income, life chances, for example, mean that factors that promote um, good health and wellbeing are not equally available, and we need to reduce these inequalities. Um, REACH are one of the first organisations, in fact, they are the first of their kind to use the, the WHO Quality of Life Survey in their approach in assessing someone's perception of their position in the context of culture and a value system. They work to enable skills and talents of people in recovery and create opportunities for people to undertake accredited learning and the intention is to promote a sense of social inclusion um, and promoting that through the, the, an SQA Level 7 Advocacy Practice Award. And I see that my time is up. It I can talk indeed. about that service a lot more, but thanks, President. Thank Mr. you. And, and please remember to use full names, Mr McGregor, in the Chamber. Um, I now call last speaker in the open debate, Michelle Ballantyne. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And can I also thank Monica Lennon for inviting us to bring this to the Chamber today. This is probably one of the most frustrating subjects that I have the pleasure to be involved with. Twelve years ago, I took over as head of service of a drug and alcohol service, and we were having the same conversation then. We were worrying about the, the drug death rates, we were worrying about how we were going to change things, and here I am, twelve years later, still having this discussion. I absolutely agree. It is a shared problem. It should be an apolitical problem, and it's a problem we need to get a grip on, and we need to do it now. It's too late to keep saying, let's have a debate on it. This is the time to take action. So on that basis, I am going to start by thanking the Scottish Government for bringing forward minimum pricing and getting it through. I supported it then, I fought for it then, and I fought for it in the context of young people. And today, I, that's what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to talk about what we need to do to change the next generation. And I'm having to do it in two minutes, which is going to be amazing if I achieve it. I'm going to talk about the three pillars of alcohol and how we change that, because that's what we need to do. We knew it back then, we've talked about it for at least 12 years, and now we need to get a grip on it. So price, minimum pricing, that's happening availability, something that we have struggled with for years. I chaired the local licensing forum, I've debated it endless, but we have to accept that as long as it is available, particularly in our poor communities, particularly in our deprived areas, then we are going to have a problem. There are 16 times more licenses than there are GP practices. That says it all to me. You can buy alcohol anywhere you go virtually now, whether it's in a garage, your local corner shop, in, in your, your every convenience element there. Why? Because it actually provides income for the people who sell it. We have to redress this, and I know it's tough, and I know people aren't going to like it, but we've got to look at it again, and we've got to think about how we actually make it available, and we've got to start getting tough on that availability and minimise where it is accessible. But the one we can do something about quicker is marketing. Marketing is aimed at young people now. It is particularly devised to do that subliminal thing of making you think that alcohol is about making your life better. What do we all say to each other? God, I've had a hard day. I need to go home and have a large glass of wine. Wow, haven't I had a great time? Let's go out and celebrate and have a drink. Everything is associated with alcohol. Commiserating, celebrating, re reviewing things. How many times do all of you say, I'm going to have a drink? To, to celebrate or to um, commiserate what's just happened. We've got to change that whole cultural thing. 
And to do that, we have to start with marketing. We have to start with those subliminal messages. So my challenge to the government today is those three pillars. You've done and that. Well, that has to be it. Sorry. Go for availability. Go for marketing. Thank you. Sorry, I'm just the time that's not available. And I call Aileen Campbell to close for the government. You've got till two o'clock. Just five oh, right, minutes. Right, just five minutes. Okay, thank you very much, President Officer. And I'm, like others, I'm grateful to Monica Lennon for bringing this debate, as I know that this particular subject has real personal significance uh, for her. And I'm grateful to Monica Lennon, particularly in the way that she's raised and articulated issues around stigma. So too the comments on this from uh, Ruth Maguire. And it is timely to debate this in the run-up to Christmas, when for many it's a time for family and happiness, but for far too many it can be a, a, a time that's lonesome, isolating, and further confirmation of the often chaotic circumstances that many children and families are living in. Those people, as Monica describes, Karen, who can be suffocated by stigma, even though there is nothing for them to be ashamed about. And that is why stigma will be a key element of the refresh and is currently work that is ongoing, with it being a focus of our PADS group. Indeed, shifting that corrosive narrative that embeds stigma was reason for Scotland's first gathering of our recovery communities together to celebrate the journey folk have been on, uh, their commitment, their achievement, and the support that they have had through uh, brought to them by dedicated teams right across the country. And it's also why I've been engaging directly with families impacted by addiction, whether that's been through uh, SFAD or FAS, who both do phenomenal work to support others. Uh, and the thing that is clear, as Ruth Maguire says, that this is not something that happens to someone else somewhere else. Addiction can impa impact any one of us. And that's why I announced uh, the Recovery Initiative Fund to help families working with SFAD to help grow family networks of support. And it's also why it's important that we listen to the voices of children. And I would certainly commend the work of the Cora Foundation and their publication, Everyone Has a Story, which is work that we support and was recently uh, celebrated here in this parliament. The MSPs are absolutely right to look behind the statistics of drug-related deaths. The drug and alcohol-related deaths, each one of them represents lives lost, potential unfulfilled and families devastated. And we must endeavour to do what we can to avoid this where we can. And in my recent statement to Parliament, I set out my intention to publish a new drug and alcohol treatment strategy. And I highlighted the need for a change as far as the quality of treatment is concerned and its consistent application, that it must be trauma-informed and it must also be uh, patient-centred. Uh, our current drug strategy, the Road to Recovery, did have cross-party support, and that is something I'm very keen to work with others on to build on for our refresh. Nevertheless, the challenges of tackling substance misuse have changed, and our, post, our approach now must be reflective of this. Looking though specifically on alcohol, we have taken bold action to tackle and reduce the damage it causes through our Alcohol Framework for Action, which includes a package of over 40 measures to reduce alcohol-related harm. And given the clear and proven link between consumption and harm, minimum unit pricing is one of the most effective and efficient ways to tackle the cheap high-strength alcohol that causes so much damage to so many individuals and families. And I'm delighted that the UK Supreme Court agreed with me and we're now pressing on with our plans for implementation. Very Monica Lennon. Interrupt, given we're so short of time, but given what we've talked a lot about availability of alcohol today, um, is the Minister able to see if a review of licensing policy will form part of this important refresh? Minister? I think what I will be saying is that there is an opportunity for us all to work out what more that needs to be done. And, and I think in response, particularly to Miles Briggs, that minimum unit pricing was only ever one tool. But I have to remind you, members, when you're talking, we're all talking about drug related deaths, that that minimum unit pricing at our preferred rate of 50 pence is estimated to prevent 58 deaths and 1,299 hospitali hospitalisations in its first year alone. I think that's really important that we recognise that while it's good that we got it through, that that's been five years that we've been avoiding having that positive impact on people's uh, lives. I have only the a minister's couple just of closing. minutes uh, left uh, to, take, uh, to finish up my remarks. The other thing that I think there is opportunity for us to uh, work together on is our new approach to drug and that's why the central aspect of our new treatment strategy will be to meet the needs of a particular cohort of hard to engage individuals and this will specifically be addressed through the development of our new seek, keep and treat framework. 
and that will examine explicitly the operational implications of engaging with older drug and alcohol users, how we encourage them into services and how we keep them there as a means of promoting protective factors associated with being in treatment. It has to absolutely be mindful of the points that Colin Smith uh, raised around the relationship between inequalities uh, and the impact that has on poor health and be bold in the same in the way that uh, Claire Hockey outlined through the safe consumption facility, uh, which is absolutely important. I have only 20 seconds, 15 seconds uh, left to uh, talk about. And I think it's important that we recognise Claire Hockey's uh, authoritative uh, 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 account for her ex Australian experience and the robust evidence showing that a rational public health uh, measure to deal with what is a public health issue must be seen in such a way. And that's the way in which we can help, I think, ensure that going forward, we try and uh, uh, help these vulnerable cohort of people who are very vulnerable, who have uh, deep inequalities at their heart, who have probably suffered adverse childhood experiences as well. There is a whole host of other ways in which we need to make sure that this isn't just a health uh, portfolio response that it does touch upon education, it does touch upon housing and the wider inequality work that we're taking forward as a government to hopefully make sure that the refreshed approach that we're outlining has the impact that it needs and doesn't necessarily just continue having conversations. I think we need to make sure that we have action as well because this issue is not going to go away and we need to ensure that what we do is uh, effective and appropriate to help tackle this uh, issue that Scotland faces. Thank you, Minister and members. That concludes members' business.